Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the third event in our alumni lecture series. My name is Sophie Schermacher, and I'm Alumni Relations Officer at Green Templeton. Um, one or two bits of housekeeping before uh, we kick off. Um, this session will be recorded so that you'll have the opportunity to watch again. You'll all be muted during the event, but we'll be holding a Q&A session at the end of Harry's talk. Please add your questions to the chat function and I'll put these to Harry. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Harry Daniels. Harry's a governing body fellow of Green Templeton College and a professor of education at the University of Oxford. Thanks to a large grant from the Economic and Social Research Council, he is currently undertaking funded research on a variety of topics, including exclusion from school and young people's feelings of safety, belonging and respect in schools. Harry's talk today will be on school ex exclusion risks after COVID-19, a very important topic affecting our young people. So over to you, Harry. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Harry Daniels, um, co-principal um, investigator on a, a large grant called Excluded Lives, which I'm going to talk about this afternoon. I'm going to do this in three stages. The first will be to give you some background about the situation with regard to exclusion from school. Um, the second will be about the project itself. And the third will be some unexpected uh, work that we've undertaken, which was, uh, has been about the new risks uh, for exclusion that have emerged during the COVID pandemic. So with that, I will now try and share my screen and hope the technology doesn't mess us around. Uh, right, I think that's working. He said with some amazement. Um, but it doesn't want to move on. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, I've undertaken work on exclusion from school for mm, 20 years. But most of it has been entirely focused within uh, the domain of education. In 2014, that's my first full year here in Oxford, I began to think about the problems that there are with that kind of research, in that it only gains glimpses of part of someone's life when they've been excluded from school. And so I set about um, making contacts with people across the dip disciplines that are to be found in the departments of, of the university. So um, uh, we have in our team psychiatrists, barristers, um, uh, lawyer, um, lawyers, uh, criminologists, people who are interested in how young people use um, new technologies and so on and so forth. Um, and that is the first distinguishing characteristic of this project is that it is genuinely multidisciplinary. It was born out of a concern about the rising rates of exclusion in England, which towards the end of writing of the, of the, writing of the proposal seemed to be in the mainstream press almost every day. They witnessed the concerns there are about the links between social exclusion and school exclusion and the, the real fears about how large scale school exclusion could lead to huge uh, ongoing problems in society. There are also concerns about inequality and overrepresentation. Most notably, um, in terms of press coverage, is the overrepresentation of um, uh, black African Caribbean males in the figures, and that's something that's endured for many, many years. There's also a number of other inequalities, particularly those connected with poverty and disadvantage. Um, another issue that's important to emphasize at the outset is that whilst we have figures of very roughly 8,000 children being permanently excluded from English schools, this is really only the tip of the iceberg because we have, we have fixed period exclusion, many, many more, but there are all sorts of unofficial, illegal um, forms of exclusion. And an interesting question, whether or someone is 
told to stand outside the classroom on a regular basis. Is that exclusion? Is that removing someone from their educational entitlements? Are they, are they being placed outside the mainstream? So the actual official figures may not be all that helpful. Um, a characteristic that lies, underlies the cases when you look at them is very often that <coughs> need is not matched with provision, rather that um, the availability of provision determines what someone gets rather than a formulation in terms of the needs they have. The need to take a multidisciplinary approach I've already mentioned. And of course, lurking in the background is that when you have a large number of young people who are not engaged in schooling of any form, uh, historically, we know that they are very, very vulnerable to um, exploitation by um, organized crime and other even more frightening elements in society. And this has been witnessed around the world um, for many, many years. It's been the case in certain parts of the UK for many years. But most recently, the discussion has been in terms of county lines probably is better thought of in terms of the exploitation of vulnerable young people by, um, by organized crime gang masters. Right, um, the sorts of concerns that they're around um, uh, uh, about the impact of high stakes testing and the removal of added value, added value models of um, evaluating schools. In other words, looking at how much improvement a school has made whether, rather than their absolute figures. It's much more complex than that. So um, in the formation of the Excluded Lives group, we undertook a number of studies, um, mostly funded by the John Fell Fund. Um, and one of them was this interdisciplinary review of permanent exclusion. And what we did there was to say, hmm, one of the problems we know is about communication across um, the uh, service lines that exist in um, any local authority. So, for example, if a young person gets themselves into serious problems, they may have a, you know, and there's a case conference. There may be a psychologist, there may be a social worker, there may be a police officer, there may be someone from child and adolescent mental health services, there may be this, uh, a, a pastoral care um, lead from the school, and so on and so forth. The likelihood of those people being at a subsequent, the same people being at a subsequent um, uh, case conference, extremely remote. Someone else, maybe they've got child care responsibilities, somebody else might have changed job, somebody else has got another meeting that they've got to go to. And you've got a very fractured form of communication. And when you look at this at the individual level, quite often one agency will not be aware of what other agencies are doing. And we um, collaborated with um, the Oxfordshire um, uh, uh, Education Department to look at all the records that they held on all the individuals who are excluded from school in a particular academic year. Um, and um, the, each line of this um, uh, um, diagram is a, a, is a particular a strand of someone's life. So this is life events, attainment and progress, what went on in secondary school, what school support was available. So what you can do here is a, a school, for instance, can look across these lines and see what is going on. Now, when we've used this with schools and services, they found it very, very useful because it's been the first time that you can track through time and across services within time of what's happening. Now, um, uh, this is a particularly tragic case, which has been anonymized, but this young person had gone through um, uh, primary schooling in a reasonably um, um, calm way. But when there was a bereavement 
in secondary school, then there are a whole series of events that went on. And interestingly, no one who was attending to each of those events knew what else was happening. And in some cases, each of those events, which were often to do with violence, were treated as individual events to be, to be published, um, to published, to be punished. And so this was a piece of work looking at the complexity of um, the patterns of provision that are offered to someone and the poverty of communicate, com communication between those services. Uh, no, it doesn't want to move. I don't know why that is. Yeah. Now, um, we moved on to another study which was looking at the differences in rates of permanent exclusion across the UK. And this is where we formed um, uh, a relationship with um, Cardiff, uh, Queen's Belfast, and Edinburgh. Um, and they remain in the, in the larger project. Um, this was prompted by um, find, us finding out that at a time when 8,000 children were permanently excluded from English schools, at the same time, three individuals were permanently removed from the register in Scotland. Not 3,000, just three individuals. So there are huge disparities in rates of officially recorded permanent exclusion um, in, um, in Scotland, and to some extent in Northern Ireland and Wales. Those differences do not exist when it's non-permanent exclusion, exclusion, fixed term or suspensions. Um, the, 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 the differences are far less, but in terms of permanent exclusion, the figures for England are staggeringly high. And it also raises some interesting questions about what really is going on. I mean, Scotland has its fair share of social disadvantage, its fair share of poverty. And those are factors which are so often linked with exclusion in England. So that is alone an adequate explanation of, of the massive differences that there are. And you can see these um, illustrated here. This is permanent exclusion in blue in England and Scotland, it just runs along the bottom of the graph with Northern Ireland and Wales being far, um, far less than England. I'm afraid I can't read this graph well because there's pictures of people across the side that doesn't matter. Um, um, there is also variation and over-representation in, um, in within settings. So if, if you look across the UK, uh, across England, there's massive differences in rates of exclusion between different local authorities. And there are, but there's a fairly constant disproportionate over-representation of certain groups of pupils. And take this, uh, um, example from the office for the children of the children's commissioner jack and jill are in the same class at secondary school jack is black caribbean and has special needs um, um, he, at the time it was assessed at school action plus he lives in a low-income household and receives free school meals jill is white british does not have a special need and lives in an affluent household Jack is 168 times more likely to be permanently excluded from school between the ages of, um, before the age of 16 and 41 times more likely to be excluded on a fixed term basis. That's huge, just huge. And those disparities are, are, are there in, um, uh, um, in, in, in over time. They're, they're, not, um, they're not just this year. There's also the hidden landscapes of exclusion. Official exclusion figures are increasingly recognized as considerable underestimates of the actual numbers of people, uh, pupils excluded from school, either temporarily or per permanently. And what then, in a, in a sort of summary, what's happened is that if we look at this, this um, graphic, um, here, a focus on academic attainment in traditional subjects and on the majority of learners, sharply reduced funding for staff and time for special needs, as against a flexible curriculum allowing non-academic subjects and responsive to social and emotional needs, 
resource, resources, time and support work for the at-risk learner. So that is this dimension. And another dimension which is in, where inclusion, a contrast between where inclusion is strongly promoted and exclusion is seen as a failure or is just morally wrong, as against exclusion being acceptable or, or, or necessary. And what's happened here is that Wales, uh, less so than Scotland, is, is um, uh, well, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland occupy this sort of position with more emphasis on a flexible curriculum and, uh, and, and, and more emphasis on in inclusion. Whereas England since 2011 has moved across the quadrants to a position where there's strong emphasis on academic attainment, uh, sharply reduced funding, and where exclusion is seen as acceptable or necessary. Um, right, so actually I looked it up the other day. We started writing this proposal in about 2017. Um, it, it's an ESRC large grant. Uh, sounds a lot of money, but in actual fact, by the time the on costs have gone on, it's not huge. It's two and a half million pounds. And we're looking at the political economies of school exclusion and their consequences. So we're looking across disciplines and across sectors. We're involved with very, very large numbers of different stakeholders with a high level of public engagement. Each um, jurisdiction, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, has, is running young people's research advisory groups where we're bringing together um, panels of young people who are either at risk of exclusion or have been excluded um, and presenting them with accounts of what the kinds of questions that we want to be asking, the kinds of things we think we'll be looking at, and we'll be seeking their commentaries on the validity um, um, of, of the approaches that we're adopting. Um, we will be incorporating some of their ideas into our own devices. So these, we are not studying these young people, they are advising us on um, uh, our work. Uh, this work comes out of um, something called the Lundy model, and Laura Lundy is a member of the Northern Irish group in the project. Uh, she's a human rights barrister based in Belfast, but her work has been adopted by the United Nations and, and they've been applying this approach in situations of high conflict and turbulence across the world in re some really, really very uh, disrupted situations. We also have a large international work network and are very well linked with policymakers and practitioners, both at no local and national level. The sorts of issues that we're going to be thinking about is what becomes the common sense of exclusion? We were very struck when we had a, a group of German educators come to visit us a couple of years ago. And we said, well, um, England permanently excludes about 8,000 young people. And I said, why? What are you doing that for? You've got a public education service. You don't throw people out of it. What do you, what, what do you need to do that for? Sure, young people can behave pretty badly at times, but surely the answer to that isn't to throw them out. But it's become a common sense of the, um, uh, the particularly the English system. And indeed, a, an academic called, called Carl Parsons wrote a very influential paper a while back, The Will to Punish, how punishment is a, uh, it's almost a leitmotif of, of many accounts of um, uh, behavior management. In, in, in England. We'll be looking at the histories and cultures of policy making, how ideas move into the, into the policy framework, how they become established. And um, that is, is on, it's actually ongoing at the moment, but also about how policy gets recontextualized in practice. And I'll give a couple examples of that. The lawyer um, who is, is an Oxford-based lawyer, um, has done some work looking at um, the law on exclusion and how it's understood in different disciplines. So she asked um, uh, solicitors and barristers about 
um, the law on exclusion. And they said something like, well, it's, it's an interesting body of law because it rests heavily on discretion, that you use the law with discretion in order to achieve the best possible outcomes for everyone who's involved. When she asked educationalists of any sort, they say, oh, it's a series of rules that you must follow. That same text, the law, had been recontextualized into practice in really very fundamental, fundamentally different ways. And you can see that with, oh, the case of um, Ritalin, um, methylphenidate, and its, its use with young people who are said to have um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, that if you read the guidance that the pharmaceutical companies put out, it, they talk of a whole number of things about the way in which that, um, that uh, treatment should be used. And yet when you look into the practice that's going on in, in some parts of the country, it almost ignores all of them. Um, we're, we're certainly looking at the challenges of multi-professional multi disciplinary understanding. And we're also concerned about the lack of clarity of purpose. Sometimes when you ask professionals why they're doing certain things, they don't be go, go beyond having to remove somebody from a situation rather than to think about the long-term consequences of what, um, um, of, of what may be happening. There's concern about the in inadequacies of the conceptualization um, uh, and lack of comparative data that are available. Um, and we'll be looking at that. There's also the pressures of accountability. Um, it's very interesting if you ask, if you speak to a school leader, sometimes they will quite rightly say, look, there are lots of incentives there for making sure that the young children that I'm responsible for attain in the best possible way. There are no incentives for me working with challenging youngsters. I don't get anything in return. I don't get any particular praise for um, that aspect of my work. And so the accountability um, um, uh, pressures are skewed one way, and that's what we're going to be looking at, particularly looking at schools which manage to work within those frameworks, but yet to achieve good results. We're also concerned about the perverse incentives that there are across the different services. And to give an example here, we've looked closely at situations in which the police and um, schools or education services were managing to work very successfully together. But it was in a situation where uh, the police service was um, driven by incentives of crime reduction when those incentives shift to uh, increasing numbers of arrests, then the collaboration between education and the police um, uh, uh, um, disintegrated. We'll also be, be, be looking at the stories that are told about at the school level, at the individual level, level about what the issues are that are in play. This is a photograph of something that was put on to um, uh, um, a, 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 a carriage of a London underground of, of a tube train. And it's the school to prison um, 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 pipeline, which a lot of concern about at the moment. But the overarching aim of the current research is to undertake a home international comparison to understand the contextual and institutional processes that lead to different types of school exclusion and the consequences for excluded young people, families, schools and other professionals in the UK. So this is a little bit now about what we're actually going, well, we are looking at at the moment. We're looking at um, the policy levers, the drivers and the legal frameworks. We're exploring the available national data on um, uh, exclusions and their social origins. So in England, that's the National Pupil Database. 
and we're doing making a particular comparison with the, the Welsh database, data are not held in the same way or in a comparable way in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And we're also looking, again, using secondary database analysis at the social costs of exclusion and the med medium and long-term social, economic and behavioral consequences of school exclusion. Particularly there, we'll be looking at the, the trajectories that young people follow after exclusion, which usually take the majority take place in the 14 to 16 age bracket, but progression into the labor market or an alternative to not in employment or education and training or into the in some sort of custodial situation. And that is well advanced at the moment, that analysis. And then we're looking also at the landscapes of public, private and third sector provision. As you probably know, what we've witnessed in the alternative provision that is offered to um, young people who are excluded is quite a lot of this has been, in England has become privatised, whereas in Scotland it hasn't. And looking at the consequences of these different, um, um, different settings. We then move to uh, studies of experiences of exclusion. So we're looking at professionals' conceptualization of risk and vulnerability, the perspectives of school leaders and teachers on the process, and students' and families' experiences of formal, informal, um, and illegal exclusion in the political economies of the four jurisdictions. So those are the two, those are the two major strands. There are also a third strand right the way through the project we're undertaking for the very first time a detailed economic um, analysis of the costs of exclusion and that doesn't just mean how much does it cost to place a young person in a pupil referral unit important as it is and there's been some work undertaken just recently that showed even that varies between fifteen thousand pounds a year and about forty two thousand pounds a year between um, local authorities in in, the, in in England. But the sort of level of detail we'll be going to with this is if a, if a psychologist is attending a, a young person, how many times do they see them? What are the costs per hour? Also, at another level, if a young person is sent home at lunchtime, often illegally, and uh, their caregiver as an afternoon shift that they should be attending and because they've got caregiving responsibilities they can't go they lose their income for that time and in one sense that is a cost as well we'll also be undertaking detailed analysis across the jurisdictions and also across the disciplines that we've got represented in the project so alongside that we've also got a scoping survey which is just about to um, um, be issued now but I'll say more about that in a moment but to give you um, a, a, well if this is true it's genuinely frightening this again is Carl Parsons who who wrote the will to punish paper in 2018 he said well let's try and get sensible estimates of the numbers of um, uh, um, young people removed from education by all means and he went through the different um, means, permanent exclusion, managed moves, elective home education, where there's been major concern at both political and um, sort of Ofsted level about the numbers of parents who for, felt, felt that they were forced to offer home education to their child because they were being rejected by the school. Reduced timetables, extended study leave, and children missing education. When we said that to the local police force, they, they said they shuddered because a, children, a child going missing from a police perspective is a truly, truly worrying situation. Anyway, Parsons came up with an, an estimate of 153,000 young people a year missing out on education. And there are some grounds to think maybe that's even if it is an overestimate, maybe not, it's not a wild overestimate. An organization called Data Lab, who do a lot of work for the government, 
took a census of children in year nine. They waited a year and took a census of ch the same children in year 10. And again, in year 11, and they found, I think it was 45,000 young people who were missing and nobody knew where they were. Um, uh, there was a question in the House of Commons last year about how many people who had been excluded from school ended up in um, unregistered or illegal schools, and the minister answered that they didn't know. There's a lot that it really is not known. Um, yes, I've just said that. I've done what I often do, get ahead of myself and say um, that the Education Data Lab people also looked at the difference between managed moves where um, it goes on in almost every authority, where one school will say, look, we've come to the end of our tether with this particular child. Will you, another school, take them on and see if you can get somewhere with them? Um, we don't really know how many of those there are. Um, uh, the outcomes are not terrifically good. Um, we know that there are proportionally more girls who go into managed move, um, but the the um, um, that that it's a phenomenon that is not well understood. So, what is there overall? Well, one there's a cultural variation in the political economies of school exclusion. We need to go beyond the numbers given to get a real understanding of what is going on, and. And we need to understand marginalization and risk from different perspectives. And um, if you have access to this, the, some of the references I've made there um, will, um, uh, might, might be of value. Now, I said about the so scoping survey, which um, um, we were about to issue. In fact, we were about to issue it in February. And then, as you're probably aware, something happened. Uh, a pandemic appeared and <clears throat> we thought well we don't want to issue it now because nobody's in school and when the when schools opened again we thought this situation has changed we're not in the same situation now that we were prior to the pandemic and we undertook a, a fairly major piece of work speaking with um uh, practi practitioners and policymakers about what they thought were the new risks of exclusion uh, following the, the lockdown. Um, and interestingly, using the technology that we're, used, we're using now today here, um, we got to speak to people who we have found it very, very hard to access um, prior um, to the to the lockdown situation. People are communicating in different ways. And we found that interesting um, of, of its own. The sorts of things that people talk to us about. Um, so if a young person had been excluded, um, in other words, they were pretty vulnerable. Um, they weren't necessarily known by social care or not have key workers. And there wasn't any provision available for them. So they were in a kind of limbo land. And there are quite a number of children who seem to be um, in that situation. There are young people who really enjoyed lockdown. They thought it was great, um, partly because um, they may have been, sometimes they may have been young people who were subject to bullying in school or found the, in, the social intensity of school a bit difficult to manage. But either at home or in very carefully constructed small groups that some schools ran, they found themselves in a much, much happier educational setting. They really enjoyed it. Um, and not surprisingly, quite a large number of the youngsters in this situation are described as being on the autistic spectrum. Um, and the concern is that that happier situation that they enjoyed during lockdown no longer obtained. So what will, what will happen to them? Um, there's also the young people who um, are, experience a multiplicity of challenges in their lives. And because of the, the, the pressures on services, the, 
um, the criteria for service provision seem to be raised. So there may be young people who just miss on having um, services provided for them. So the psychologist might say, well, I'm really sorry, but um, I've got so many people on my books at the moment and you're, you're not quite at a level where I should be engaging with you. Or the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service might say, I'm, you know, I'm, we recognize that it would be in an ideal world, it would be better to do more preventative work, but we're sorry, we just don't have the capacity to work. So across a multiplicity of, of services, these young people will be just missing out on provision. And we know from work in the special needs field going back 50 years, that when you face a challenge in your life, well, if you've got two issues in your life, probably you'll be able to cope with them. Probably you'll be able to find a way around them. By the time it gets to three issues in your life, then the, the, it, it's no longer additive, the effect of these difficulties. It, it becomes multiplicative in some way or another and becomes rapidly, um, the impact becomes much more severe. And there are many young people at the moment who may have four or five disadvantaging factors in their lives, but are yet are not in receipt of provision because they don't quite hit the, um, the entry criteria. So there's, there's, there's those. Um, uh, there's, um, there's also, um, when we spoke to the NHS lead on safeguarding, um, he used the expression pressure cooker homes. And he also used the expression contextual safeguarding. He said, we all really ought to go beyond the situation where saying, oh, um, this has happened, this child uh, assaulted a teacher, or um, this child has been selling drugs in school or whatever else it, it is. We need to get to the situation, one, not to condone that, but to understand where it's come from. What are the reasons that this kind of inappropriate behavior um, um, started in the first place? Because it's, because it's there that we may be able to do something to become, stop it becoming a much more widespread phenomena. Now, this kind of approach, the contextual safeguarding approach is being adopted, most notably in our experience, in some of the violence reduction units that the Home Office has sponsored. It's a very good effect, but it's by no means wide, what, what widespread. In the pressure cooker homes, you've got young people who may have, may have been in situations where the family lived in a relatively small uh, rented apartment with no outside space available to them, not even a balcony where if there had been internet access, it would be only through one machine. And there may be three or four people in the house who wanted to use that machine. There may have been um, all sorts of different kinds of conflict. There may have been not enough money coming into the house for food and clothing in the way that uh, had been in, in the past because jobs had disappeared. And uh, that kind of act and or, and or conflict with, with neighbours, that kind of pressure building up on people um, was described to us as a bit like taking a Coca-Cola bottle and shaking it and shaking it and shaking it. And when they come out of that situation, releasing the top and all sorts of things. And the um, mental health workers we spoke to were very concerned about rises in self-harm that were taking place as a result of the kind of pressures that people have been under. There were also widespread reports of young people who really did not engage with the online tuition that was being offered by schools, if indeed it was being offered by, by their school, because some schools did really, really well with the online provision, others not quite so well. And um, in whatever circumstances, some young people just said, no, I'm not doing that. They also didn't engage with any hard copy materials that were being offered by the, by the, um, by the school. They often didn't engage terribly well with their families. 
and got into some sort of dispute with their family. And what they were doing was going out and, um, and uh, associating with their, without social distancing, associating with um, groups of young people who they knew in the locality. Um, there is considerable concern that young people in this kind of grouping uh, may never re-engage with school. Now, whether we don't know how that's running at the moment, but that certainly was what was voiced to us, that there are maybe 10 to 15% of the school population at secondary level who have become more distant from the, right, the rhythms and um, rituals of schooling. And so there's, there's and, you know, a, a major concern about that. So those were some of the, the sorts of um, uh, um, issues that we, we, people talk to us. We, we, we published that online and it, it became, it became quite popular. We were surprised how many of the major policy making groups wanted to speak to us since. And we've since written um, documents about the policy implications of the new um, forms of exclusion. But that's not for today because I've now, remarkably for me, managed to stop talking at precisely quarter two, which was when I was asked to stop. So if I can hand over to Sophie now, who is going to um, manage the question and answer session. Hi, Harry. Um, wow, absolutely fascinating and some quite distressing figures in there. Um, we have a question from Professor Denise Leversley, previously, uh, um, well, until very recently, our principal. Um, she'd like to start with saying um, thank you from her for a great programme of research. Um, so Denise's question is, could you say something about the national accountability? Um, the UK has signed up to international agreements relating to no child left behind. Does this have any impact on practice within the UK? And as a school governor, what's my responsibility in this regard? And what questions should I be asking? Um, I think with all these things, both an international and national and by the way, hello, Denise, wherever you are, I can't see you. Um, um, at both at national and international level, the way these are taken up and made, made, made meaningful in, in particular schools varies enormously. So, for example, at the moment, we have some schools that operate a zero tolerance um, policy and some schools that part of that zero tolerance would be and a colleague in the Reese Centre, which uh, in the department, which, which looks at um, young people in public care, found um, young people in, being put in secluded settings where they were sent to areas where they were asked to look at a wall, which was painted black, and sit there with no work for six weeks. That's the worst example, the worst example of anything we came across. But there is a much more general issue about the balance there is between a focus on attainment and a focus on well-being. And um, oh, I don't know what I've done now. Uh, sorry. And there's um, the I mean I think he's chair of the Parliamentary Education Committee, Robert Halfen, has written very powerfully about that and, and suggesting that that some schools are operating in a more a way that is morally questionable about the way they're balancing different pressures on them. So I do think there is a need to adjust the accountability um, uh, measures that are placed on schools. I do think there is a, ne a need for um, England particularly to look much more closely at some of the international agreements that uh, um, have been established. But um, the UK is generally has been quite good at trying to avoid some of those. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's the, the balancing. And also alongside that, there's the temptation to think one size fits all, that, that you've got a, um, 
um, a, a situation where something has happened and that something fits into a particular category and that category of something gets a particular form of intervention which is is really probably exactly the wrong way to go that there needs to be a much more detailed and fine-grained analysis of need remembering that the children's commissioner said that every time a child gets excluded from school there should be a much more a detailed analysis of their educational needs that's not been done so far but that sort of thing so that we can bring in provision into a more focused um, engagement with the needs of the young person lovely thanks harry um got another question it seems to me that the education system has been resistant to evolution over the last few decades to a greater extent than other major public services in terms of matching changing expectations of provisions useful to modern life would you agree with this and what does that say about our ability to improve the situation of difficult to handle pupils um, this is from rosalind atkins thank you rosalind right um i think i think there is a um we've all experienced education and there is a sort of retrospective romanticism about what we had and uh, therefore what should be now and the political pressure that's brought on to do certain kinds of things seems to be more apparent in england if you look at the guidance and the statutory um instruments they, they, they will start in England with something like it's the head teacher's right to exclude. And they will talk about behavior that needs to be managed. In Scotland, they don't talk about behavior at all. They talk about relationships. Um, and the ways in which those different accounts of the place of community, the, the place of communication and relationship is very, it's culturally very different between those two settings. Um, I mean, I think, I think the statement you, you read out is, is sadly um, has got some, uh, some real meaning that we, we, uh, we, we, there are some elements in, in the political system who would like to see us return to almost grad grind like um, situations. Thankfully, people like Robert, I think it's Halfen, um, seem to be offering a more enlightened view but it, we're a very long way off, um, even the work that's going on in Scotland at the moment. Um, we have another question here from Tony. Sorry, I can't hear you, Sophie. I'm sorry, uh, we have another question from Tony Eid Ord. I'm probably mispronouncing that, I apologise. Um, have you looked at the trajectory of exclusions from primary schools onwards? and seen any indicators of likelihood of exclusion, especially those which are other than the ones you've mentioned? Um, we, we're, we're not looking at primary schools, although um, formally we're not funded to do that. Um, we had to make a decision quite early on in the formulation of the project where we would focus. The numbers in primary schools are relatively low. Um, we know that um, if a child in primary school receives a fixed period exclusion, about 50% of them then carry on to um, have subsequent exclusions, but we don't know that much about the those that don't, what, what happens to them. We do know that there is um, mounting concern amongst education officers about the numbers of um, uh, really very young children who are being excluded even before the age of five um, and that is um, that is something that's been bubbling for a little while but seems to be getting worse at the moment and i really find that quite quite a challenge myself um, when i worked in birmingham the then director of education tim brighouse asked me to go to a very large um, um, local authority housing estate on the east side of Birmingham where um, uh, uh, the head teachers of nursery schools talked to me and they all use the expression Chinese with attitude 
which was about you know, four-year-olds that they could no longer manage. And we have to ask, what is it that's led to this kind of situation? Um, I can't see any questions coming in, but I've got one actually. Hmm. How, how much do you think low literacy rates are connected with exclusion rates? They are, definitely. That's one of, one of, the, one of the primary indicators at age 11, low literacy um, is, is highly associated with um, uh, difficulty in schooling and with some that difficulty is um, progresses into the into the, the realms of behavior that is considered unacceptable in schools but what we have to factor into that um, is that um, I wouldn't have to walk terribly far well a day's walk from Green Templeton and I could find a school that when it was non-pandemic days if a child used the street vernacular no not even that swore at a teacher that teacher might say look really that is not helpful um, I find it offensive it's not getting us anywhere here can you please not do that We've got a job to do here. Can we sit down and get on with it? If you don't understand with it, I will go through it with you. I've no trouble about that and see if we can help you make this place. In another school, they would be excluded. Um, so the differences that operate in the cultures of different kinds of schools. Um, we, we've got uh, one of the many, many uh, groups we have an engagement with is called the St. Giles Trust which operates with particularly, well, it, it operates a lot in London. It did some of the work for the Home Office on county lines. And they were talking with our lawyer colleague about young people being excluded for possession of cannabis as a first offence. And, and this was widespread in some South London schools. And according to our lawyer, explicitly written into the police guidance, is that young people on their first offence of possession of marijuana should not be excluded from school because that then leads, can tip you over into another trajectory entirely of progressively uh, more difficult situations. So the variation between schools in how they implement um, uh, and the rates of, uh, um, of exclusion are so very different i mean we are working with four local authorities in depth in the b themes which is the experiences of exclusion and we're working with two northern um local authorities both of which have traditionally very high rates <coughs> of exclusion but interestingly in one of them which is very much in the news at the moment um, we had a conversation with the the incoming chief education officer and I said well if I look at the figures that are held on exclusion for last year in your authority they don't look too bad and he said they're not correct they're you know historically reporting has been inefficient that we don't know what is going on so you've got that kind of phenomenon but we we know that there are some authorities which have historically very high levels of exclusion. One authority which excluded about 40% temper fixed period exclusion, 40% of the entire secondary school population in one year, 40%. Um, whereas other local authorities, for instance, Oxford, Oxfordshire has below, um, below average and historically has had below average. That's not to say everything's rosy, but um, it has had below average rates of exclusion. The variation is enormous. I mean, we've I think we've got just about enough time to squeeze one last question, and this is from um, Chris Heemskirk, one of our DPhil students. I was wondering if the system in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland is the same as England or to several European countries where when children who don't pass their subjects, they repeat the year or get extra help. I've seen children in Oxfordshire schools who cannot spell their own name by the end of primary school. 
I'm not surprised these children become disengaged and disaffected and will be more likely to get excluded. What are your views on this? Well, grade repetition, which is um, so, uh, used to be in France, I don't know if it still is, is not a feature of um, the, the uh, UK jurisdictions. Um, I think I'd like to draw attention to the differences between what goes on in the UK and what the Finns do. Now the Finns are famous for having Pisa tourism. They, they take, um, there, are, there are tour operators who used to anyway, um, take people to look at Finnish schools who charge people to come and look at what they're doing because everyone wants to know how they do so well in the Pisa schools. But the other thing they do that isn't so widely talked about is that they have a, a special needs support system which operates at the moment that somebody doesn't understand something. So very close monitoring of how children are progressing. When somebody doesn't understand something, they say, right, we need to deal with this now. Whereas in other countries, what you get is a, a waiting before there's enough of a a gap between where the child is and where the child should be that it justifies intervention and by that time the damage has been done so maybe 40 to 50 percent of Finnish school children might have special needs support at some time during their school careers but it may only be for a week um, in order to, to try and get around a, a misunderstanding or um, uh, 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 a conceptual difficulty that they're having. Okay, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to end there. Um, I could listen to this all afternoon, it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. That's a pleasure. Um, Sorry, I've lost you again, Sophie. Oh, sorry, it is incredibly valuable work, and I, I do hope that things change <laughs> as yeah. a result of your research. Well, well let's hope so. Let's hope so. Anyway, thanks very much, everyone. So thank you. Um, many thanks to everyone for attending uh, this lecture. Harry has very kindly produced a handout, actually, which we will send you together with the recording of um, this lecture. So you'll have an op another opportunity to, to watch it. Um, and do remember, we have three more lectures to come in the series, and we're looking forward to seeing you there. Do look out for registration details in your emails. Thank you.